Good morning, Rock family. My name is Sean Patterson, and I am one of the members of the teaching team here. And I am coming to you from my house, finishing up quarantine with my family. You know, it's just fitting that we would finish up 2020 this way. Yeah. Hey, listen, I just want to first and foremost say thank you for your prayers, for your text messages, for the calls while we've been out. Amy was exposed to someone a few weeks ago who has COVID and she began to experience symptoms and being the great giver that she is, um, I quickly began experiencing the same symptoms. And uh, but, uh, but if I can just brag on you guys for a moment, you know, we felt so loved and so cared for by you. We had uh, meals left on our porch. We had, you know, groceries that showed up unexpectedly. Christmas shopping was done for us. I mean, there was... And there was a point when my girls looked at us and they were like, man, y'all need to get sick all the time. So, uh, you know, it, it's moments like these where we are reminded just how vital church family is. And so maybe that's my first encouragement as we begin today, that in a time where uh, our families, our friends, our neighbors, our coworkers, our nation as a whole is experiencing major disorientation, uh, we, uh, you know, as Americans, we, we, you know, we traditionally have been a pretty overconfident culture, but many of us right now are very unsure of the future. You know, we're in a moment in history, and, and I don't think we can say this much, and it doesn't really happen much, but we're in this moment where both the church and the world agrees that there are problems to solve. And so, uh, you know, if we as little Christ, right, Christians are going to be effective in the time that we're in, it's gonna take a grassroots effort to love people well. And so going into 2021, let's be thinking about how we can do that. You know, it's easy to bring flowers to a funeral, right? But what the world really needs are people who bring them soup when they're sick, right? And Amy and I, we've witnessed that in the past few weeks. That is who we are, church, it's who we are. And no one modeled that better than Jesus, amen? So Isaiah chapter nine, uh, verse two, it starts like this. It says, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. Uh, they rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. Here's a key verse. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end, and he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Uh, we are closing out an Advent series that we've been calling Preparing for the Promise, and you know, we, we've kind of dropped ourselves uh, into the time of Isaiah 9, about 700 years before the birth of Christ, which uh, is the same time that Homer was telling us about white-armed Hera. Now, Hera was the wife of Zeus. She was uh, the queen of the ancient Greek gods. And so right away, centuries before the God of the Bible makes his appearance on earth, uh, he is already being rivaled and mentioned in parallel with fictional and mythical deities. And it's this, this reoccurring theme for hundreds and thousands of years. Uh, and, and it's the type of thing that makes the idea of Christmas so unbelievable because although the Bible says to us, a child is born, to us, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders uh, and he will be called wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. Uh, you know, although the, the, the Bible says that, he gets ranked and filed among many other supers who came to earth to save the world. See, Jesus Christ is not the only super to be a single man. Jesus Christ is not the only super to stand up for justice against overwhelming odds. Uh, he is not the only super to die for the world. 
And he certainly isn't the only super to rise from the dead. So why are we doing this? Huh? I mean, surely he's no different than Santa Claus, the Easter Bunny, or the Tooth Fairy, right? Now, a couple things that you'll notice uh, when you look at the works of guys like Homer and Stan Lee and Jerry Siegel and, and other creators in comics uh, is that when creating a superhero, the only way to uh, make them believable is if they have a weakness, right? Uh, like, do we really believe, you know, in perfect people, right? But, but if you think about Hera, right, although she was a goddess who represented the ideal woman, she was uh, the goddess of marriage and family, she is most famously known for her jealous and vengeful nature uh, as her husband Zeus was very unfaithful and it, it caused her to take swift revenge, which had all these you know, unintended consequences. Uh, you have guys like, uh, guys like Achilles, whose weaknesses was his heel, right? Superman had an issue with kryptonite and so on and so forth with heroes. Uh, another thing that's consistent is that even in a fictional world, comics and creatives are always showing us just how complex and hard it is to save the world. And I'm thinking of the scene uh, in the movie Bruce Almighty, and, and I know he's not a superhero, but in, in that movie Bruce Almighty, God offers Bruce his powers because Bruce accuses him of being bad at his job. And there's this moment where uh, Bruce realizes that all the prayers in the world are going unanswered. And it's, it's literally enough to drive him insane. Uh, or think of the movie The Incredibles, right? Uh, they're constantly saving the world, but the world doesn't, not only do they not appreciate them, but they villainize them, right? And so think about the difficulty here. Like how in the world do you save the world when the problems of the world are being caused by the people in it? Like, like how do you uh, save a people who seem hell bent on hell? Like, like how do you uh, save damsels who seem to love to be in distress? Fictional writers can't answer that question. And so uh, you look at Isaiah 9 though, and it's as if you know, Isaiah is speaking on behalf of God and he's giving the people of God who are in deep despair and, and, and hopelessness uh, promises, right? They need a hero. And our condition is no different than that. It's no different. And so uh, the message of Isaiah is that the God of the Bible cares for his creation so much and he takes our misery and our suffering so seriously that he was willing to take it on himself. We are his weakness, but we are his kryptonite, right? right? Well, we, we are his Achilles heel. And it's because of our unfaithfulness that he had to come and take swift revenge. And, and his revenge isn't him coming in and trying to crush us. He came to be crushed. And so Jesus Christ is not like Zeus or Hera or uh, he's, he's not like Superman or Batman or, or he's not like, you know, the Tooth Fairy or Santa Claus, right? Uh, Jesus is real. And Christmas is the testimony of that message. It's the testimony of that reality. And so in the time that we have left, this is what I want to do. What I want to do is I want to show you how Christmas is a message of what God had to endure to get to us, what we must endure to receive him and why it's all worth it, okay? First, what God had to endure to get to us. Now, Isaiah chapter uh, nine, verse six says, to us, a son is given. Now, I want you to think about this. If you were tasked with saving the world, how would you do it? Huh? Now, remember, fictional writers have found this to be very difficult. They actually needed to introduce a character who possessed supernatural abilities, and even then, it was nearly impossible. So how would you do it? Would you, would you go Revelation style, white horse, cloud, right, with a host of angels? Uh, would, you, would you be like a, a UFO, right? Would you just come and invade? Like if you were the creator of heaven and earth and you were tasked with saving the world, how would you come? Isaiah said he would come as a son. He's going to come as a child. He's going to be born. And he's going to save the world, but he will arrive as one attached to a placenta receiving life and nourishment from his own creation. And so it turns out that God could have come to save the world in so many different contexts, but he does so, he chooses to do so through family. Now, let that be a lesson to those of us who feel like we were made to do something great. You know, that there are many of us, we, we, we know that we were meant to leave a mark. We want to change the world. But God is still saving the world through family. 
And so loving our, our family well, uh, developing godly kids is our best gift to this world. It's our greatest contribution to a future we'll never see. Jesus comes as a son. Not only that, he comes in poverty. See, God comes to save the world, yet uh, he, he's, he seems to completely disarm and disadvantage himself. And so Jesus enters this world in abject poverty. See, the only place that, 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 that they could put him when he's born is a feeding trough. And so he's not born in a palace. He's not trusted to the elite, but rather an oppressed Middle Eastern culture. And even within that culture, he has no more religious clout because everyone believes that he's born out of wedlock. And so his whole life is this way. I mean, even as an adult, he has to confess to someone, man, foxes have holes and, and birds have nests, but I don't even have anywhere to lay my head tonight. Paul in 2 Corinthians talks about how the grace of Jesus towards us uh, is that uh, though, though he was rich, he became poor. And, and that through his poverty, we might become rich, right? Uh, in the book of Philippians, it says that although Jesus existed in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking on the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. And being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself by being obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. And so uh, the son of God did not exploit his equality with the father but rather he revealed his greatness and his willingness to become the father's servant by coming to this world. Then you read the gospels and what you see is that Jesus doesn't even use his power to oppress us, but instead he sacrifices everything to bring us into union with him. And so he comes as a son, he comes in poverty, and he also comes in vulnerability. See, in order to save the world, uh, God makes himself mortal. This is mission impossible, and he knows it, and he comes anyway. He enters in uh, through the high risk of childbearing to a, a poor Middle Eastern teenage woman, and, and before he can even walk and talk, he is evading assassination, and his parents have to hide, right? Also, you see as an adult, the, the people of his hometown try to kill him, uh, Pharisees try to stone him. And after he raises his friend Lazarus from the dead, the whole religious system plots to kill him. And so this is what's so hard about saving the world, right? The damsel in distress is also the villain. See, Jesus came to save the very people who would kill him. And I, I love the way that, that Tim Keller says this. Uh, he says it this way. He says, all human beings are in their natural condition in a state of warfare against God. We're all hostile towards God. We're all fighting against God. And that's the way it is. The proof of that, the only time God ever came, became vulnerable to us, the, the, the only time God ever became weak, the only time God ever became touchable, we killed him. And so to understand Christmas, you've got to know uh, what God endured to get to us. He came as a son, he came in poverty, he came in vulnerability, and in an effort to save us. But it's, but it's also about our response, see, because Christmas shows us what we also must endure to receive him. See, Isaiah 9, 6 says, for to us a child is born. See, the, the creator of, of, of all creation, that the savior of the world, this divine gift comes to us through one of us. From, from the womb of a woman, God breaks into this world, and by doing so, he honors and dignifies the sacrificial and holy calling of being a mother. You know, I've, I've been fortunate enough to, to see this process play out six different times. I was old enough and, and coherent enough to watch my mother uh, give birth and, ex, you know, and all that stuff to, my, to my, my sisters. And I just remember her being unbelievably sick and being placed on bed rest uh, and being fed all these IVs just to survive. And I, I'm obviously acquainted with my wife's morning sickness and, and all the pain and, and the expansion, uh, not just of her body, but of our lives as a whole. And, and though I'm not the one who actually gave birth, uh, I can honestly say that having children is one of the hardest yet rewarding things we've ever done. So will it be to birth the will of God in your life. Carrying and executing the will of God can only happen through the methodology of a painful process. And why not, right? Salvation came to this world through a painful process. 
The son was given to die on a cross. And so receiving Jesus is anything but easy. It's uncomfortable and disorienting, right? Uh, Amy is a classic stomach sleeper. And so watching her figure out creative ways to sleep was no fun. Seeing her hug more toilets than she hugged me in the first trimester of pregnancy was no fun. Uh, witnessing the disappointment on her face when she couldn't fit into her clothes anymore was no fun. You know, everything changed for us. See, having children is not just uncomfortable and disorienting, uh, but it's also a commitment that never leaves. Um, you know, you will always have parents, right? Even if they're no longer living, they have no doubt left an indelible mark on your life. And if you're fortunate enough to have children, you will always be a parent. You know, every now and then, Amy and I, we fantasize about what life will be like as empty nesters. And then we are reminded by many of you guys who are much further ahead of, of Amy and I, uh, that this is not actually a thing, right? That parenting just evolves, right? But the commitment never goes away. And so conceiving, nurturing, laboring that which God puts in us is a commitment that lasts a lifetime. And so it's uncomfortable and disorienting. It's a commitment that never leaves. And it's also a, a mark, it leaves a lasting mark on us. You know, one of the, the funniest things I saw Amy struggling with in the process of having children is how hard she worked to keep stretch marks off her body. <laughs> uh, she exercised, she watched her eating, uh, she bought and applied really expensive anti-stretch cream and nothing helped. <laughs> And, and then once her body was stretched out, she assumed that every child would stretch her the same. But all four of our children stretched her body in different ways and they produced their own marks, right? My precious wife bears the marks and scars of motherhood. And they are beautiful scars. They are sacred scars. And it's really one of the reasons why pornography is so offensive and, 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 and why an affair would be so damaging. And, and why billboard women do not get to have my attention because ultimately they did not pay the price to bear my children. And so Amy Patterson will get grace from me to age with dignity. Why? Because those are our marks. We made them, we own them, right? And so bringing God's will to bear will leave permanent marks. It'll leave marks on you that will always remind you of your sacred history. Right? Christmas is about that which God endured to get to us and about what we also must endure to receive him. But now let me tell you why it's all worth it, right? Because understanding what it cost him to come and what it cost to receive him, by doing that, we earn the ability to know him as wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father and prince of peace. And to know him this way is everything. See, the religious person sees God as useful, but the Christian sees God as beautiful. Christmas is about beholding the wonder of his love. And, and until you do, Christmas will always be this holiday that comes and goes. It, it, it'll always be this thing that produces this great feeling and then it goes away. It, it'll be this occasion to decorate a tree and, and to give and receive gifts, but you will miss the best gift. And so we're offering it to you again right now. And so we're gonna pray in a minute, but before we do, it's important for you to know that at best, fictional superheroes can only save the day, that they can save the world today, but tomorrow something else is coming. Even fictional writers know that superpower, uh, you know, anything they think of is inadequate to save the world ultimately. But then enters Jesus, and he was born into this world as a child, he comes as a son, he, he comes to us in poverty, he comes in vulnerability, then we kill him. See, the very people who he came to save undermine their own source of salvation. And so, beloved, you have to see this, that when Jesus Christ hung on the cross, pouring out his life for you and me, he was a hero dying for villains. This was mission impossible, yet Isaiah was so sure of it that he spoke of it as if it were already accomplished. In Isaiah 9, he said, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, light has dawned, right? He has enlarged the nation and has increased our joy. He has shattered the yoke that burdens us. And so your salvation is so sure that it is spoken of 
in past tense, but you have to receive them. And it'll be uncomfortable and disorienting. Uh, it's a commitment that never goes away and it'll permanently mark you forever, but it's worth it because you will truly know him as he is. Jesus is wonderful counselor. He knows everything. Jesus is mighty God. He's stronger than everything. Jesus is everlasting father. He controls everything. And Jesus is Prince of Peace. He resolved everything. And the message of Christmas is that a God this great has come to dwell in and among us. What a gift. Amen. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you were not fiction. Lord, I thank you uh, that, that you came to us in a very real way. Lord, we praise you for all you endured to come to us, and we ask you to strengthen us and to do all we must in order to receive you. Lord, Lord, even as I pray right now, Lord, I know that there are those listening who are grappling with this decision. I know they are, Lord. And so by your spirit, help us to see you as you are. And so if you're here today, and you would say, Sean, I, I want to receive this gift at Christmas. I want to live for Jesus. I want you to pray this prayer with me. Pray this prayer. Say, thank you, God. Thank you, God, for coming for me. Thank you for giving your life for me. Lord, I receive you into my life and in my heart today. Lord, I repent for all that I've done, and I'm grateful for what you've done to make things right. Lord, forgive me for my sins cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Lord, I give my life completely and wholly to you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Listen, if you said those words and you meant those words, and if, they, if, if you didn't just say it with your lips, but you meant it, um, this changes everything. It, it, it changes everything. And I, I'm so excited for, for what God's doing in your life. And uh, we are so thankful for you, Rock Church. God bless you. Have a great uh, rest of the year, uh, and we'll see you in 2021. Amen. Take care.